Easter Monday and Easter Tuesday in League One had everything. It's time we break it all down in a bumper episode of The Roundup. Let's go. I should say before we start, if you do find any value from the podcast, please make sure you leave a like and subscribe. Over 60% of the people that watch this podcast on a regular basis aren't yet subscribed. Please make sure you do that. It's free to do so. It helps me grow my podcast and expand in different ways. It's really important. Thank you so much. Let's begin with the first game at Carlisle as they hosted Lincoln City. Carlisle 1, Lincoln City 3 was the final score. The XG was 1.27 to 0.85. Looking at it from a Carlisle perspective first, a performance of two halves is the best way of describing their display. Really poor in the first 45 and then much brighter in the second. Defensively, the issues have been prominent all season. There's a sheer lack of cohesion, organisation, technical ability, 73 goals conceded in 41 games. That's all the evidence you need. As for Lincoln City, it won't be their prettiest, most free-flowing display of the campaign, but against the side playing with total freedom, often that can be just as tricky. The incredible mentality and confidence is rippling through this Scubala outfit. It's relentless, it's ruthless, and it's another crucial three points. That's now five straight League One wins. Their unbeaten run extends to 15. They remain inside that top six on goal difference. When looking at the graph brought to you by SofaScore, Lincoln's start was superb. They got that early goal and managed the rest of that first 45 to perfection. Carlisle's second half display was incredibly bright. They controlled large amounts of the ball, played with a real sense of pace and purpose in the final third. It was then Lincoln's job to concede pressure, dig in and hurt them in transition. We're looking at the stats. Lincoln's approach before and after the break really is just another example of Scubala's effective coaching intelligence. We've spoken before about his unique footballing principles, not being obsessed with high numbers of possession and him being at ease with chaos. His focus is on quick decision making, ensuring his side is well drilled in a proactive and reactive sense within games. The away side might have only had 39% of the ball, completing 89 passes in the second half, but two split second moments can change games and that's exactly what happened. Lincoln are one of the most clinical sides in League One right now. After the break, they accumulated an XG of 0.41, converting their only shots on target they had. But Joe Taylor's influence is crucial. Take a look at this graph by The Analyst, a brilliant website. Essentially, it tells us how many shots it takes for a player to score. It compares non-penalty shots and goals per 90 minutes played. You can see Joe Taylor is currently averaging one goal every six shots. For comparison, the current top goal scorer, Alfie May, is averaging a goal every 10. Now, we've gone quite heavy on Lincoln's fantastic attacking threat, but their ability to defend effectively, I think, is just as important. That's from back to front two. Scubala does need his forwards to press and defend from the front. But again, defensively, Scubala mentioned after the game, the two goals came from protecting their own box well, getting up the pitch and causing havoc in the final third. Across the 90 minutes, Lincoln won 58 duels, made 37 clearances and eight interceptions. Their back line dealt with... 37 defensive actions. It finishes Bolton 5, Reading 2, the non-penalty XG 1.87 to 0.88. Let's begin with the home side and winners Bolton Wanderers. When it works, it works. Monday was another example of all of the key ingredients falling into place. Naturally, it poses the question, the million dollar question. The most frustrating question if you are a Bolton Wanderers fan, why can't they play with that brilliant level of pace and purpose and zip on a consistent basis? After last night's game between Pompey and Derby, Bolton are now four points behind second place, of course though with a game in hand. When looking at it from a Reading perspective, going forward, I thought there were glimpses of quality. Defensively, the basics were hardly there at times. They felt quite lethargic, quite careless with their approach at points, and, and that could be tiredness. It could be them being 4-1 down and out of the game. But it's also important to remember games away to Bolton won't define their survival hopes. Aspects have to be better, of course, but it's about how they reset and don't let this result sort of derail their entire campaign. 
When looking at the graph in front of you, Bolton had complete control of the first 45. Perhaps could have created slightly more, but the general patterns were really good. The second 45 was about chance conversion. Reading grew into it, but Bolton's clinical output killed the match off well. Bolton's attacking play was fantastic. They suffocated Reading's box time and time again. They had 47 touches inside the opposition box, the highest number of touches compared to every League One club competing this weekend. Second place was actually Carlisle, so that's interesting. Of course, we can't speak about the brilliance of Bolton's attacking play and not mention Aaron Collins because he stole the show. His partnership with Bud Varson was crucial and it reminded me of their double act performance against Oxford United last month. Bud Varson's work in link up is pivotal. Take a look at his heat map here. He's so much deeper than Collins, but his work without the ball is really, really important. He made five passes into the final third, only touched the ball twice inside Reading's box, but of course, scored two goals on the day. Collins finished the game with a 50% conversion in front of goal, accumulating nine touches inside the opposition box, the most out of every player on the pitch. The general attacking metrics between Bolton and Reading look extremely similar, but as I mentioned on Saturday, I'm far more interested in the areas in which these shots are being taken. Both teams had 18 shots and Bolton only had one more shot on target, but take a look at the shot maps, there's a massive difference. 11 of Reading's 18 shots were from outside the box, of course a great strike came from that distance. But is there a consistent, sustainable goal threat from those positions? I'm not sure. Only creating an open play XG of 0.69 suggests a lot of those efforts weren't great chances. The final point to take from this game, I think, is Reading's defensive frailties. I think three, perhaps four of the goals they conceded were avoidable. And that only highlights the ongoing issues they're having at the back. Their expected goals against this season stands at 32.49, but they've conceded 41 open play goals. Essentially, they've conceded nine more open play goals than statistically they should have done. They rank 18th for goals against per 90, currently averaging 1.5 goals conceded a game. But the Kassam, it finishes Oxford 4, Fleetwood 0. The XG, 2.47 to 0.64. From an Oxford perspective, it was a convincing, enjoyable, relentless afternoon. And those are three words that we haven't been able to associate with this side for some time now. Des Buckingham made some bold calls with his team selection and his general setup, really. And we'll praise him for that because it was brave. It provided a consistent attacking intent and ultimately it won us the game. From a Fleetwood point of view, a bad day at the office. And if we're being honest, that's happened far too many times this season. That's why League Two looks more and more likely. A sloppiness defensively, rare chance creation, but actually poor finishing when rare opportunities did arise. You combine those elements and it's no shock Fleetwood fans just want this season to come to an end. The away side are now six points adrift, with teams above them having at least one game in hand. After a decade in League One, I think it could be close to being over. Take a look at the graph in front of you. After a slow opening 10 minutes, Oxford settled and found their groove. The creation was free-flowing and the chances were being taken. The second half was slightly more even. Fleetwood made a few tweaks and started to play with some intent. The only issue being they were three goals down by that point. With the ball, Oxford was so effective. They had 62% possession, completing 488 passes. They also provided output, which is something that's been missing in recent weeks. Of course, four goals, 23 shots, but 56% of those on target. Five big chances, which is the highest number since Des Buckingham arrived. When looking at Buckingham's time at Mumbai City, it's very clear he wants to operate with a single six and two advanced eights in front. Take a look at the average positions from Monday. It's clear Goodrum and Ruben operated as those two eights with Brannigan slightly deeper. When Oxford look to attack, they commit bodies and they create a dangerous overload. It's also then really important a good chance is created and they're not getting caught on the turnover. Cameron Brannigan's role is so important. Essentially, he controls everything that goes through and builds up from the middle. Take a look at his personal heat map. The bloke is absolutely everywhere, covering so much ground. He breaks up play, dictates the tempo, carries the ball and provides crucial goal contributions. I want to come back to how he carries the ball. Brannigan has made 43 progressive carries that have ended in a chance being created this season. That's more than Abu Kamara, Paddy Lane and the league's top assistant, Harrison Burrows. 
another Oxford standout has to be Josh Murphy. He's playing some of his best football, not just at Oxford, but his career as well. We speak about wingers in a dead system, but Murphy's actually operating almost as an inside forward. Take a look at his heat map. It shows a lot of his game is actually inside the opposition box. He carries the ball effectively and drives inside the area looking to either score or create. Murphy's accumulated 35 chance creating carries this season, averaging a carry distance of 15.86 metres, the second highest in League One. On a blistery night at Fratton Park, it finishes Pompey 2, Derby County 2. The XG 0.84 to 0.75. Let's begin with the home side. A well-earned, positively aggressive, hard-fought point. Probably the happiest Pompey fans have been with just a singular point all season. But it's just another crucial step towards promotion. It wasn't always smooth sailing. At times, Pompey had to learn on the job, if you like. But it's the character and squad spirit that we've been speaking about and we come back to all season. This leaves the home side with five games to go. With my crystal ball in front of me, I think three more wins would just about do it. Don't, don't see that as a guarantee, but it's, it's close, Pompey fans. It's very, very close. As for Derby County, it might sound silly to praise a team's defending when they can see twice, drop two points from two winning positions, but the disciplined out of possession shape was phenomenal from Derby and limited Pompey to just a handful of moments. We'll break down the tactical elements to Derby shape later, but in short, it was compact, carefully structured and always ready to transition quickly and punish on the break. Their second place cushion now extends to four points, meaning now if Bolton win their game in hand, they would stay inside the automatic promotion places. Let's show you the graph in front of you. Derby's threat on the break, especially in the first half, is demonstrated perfectly here. Both patches of blue before the break lead to a goal in transition. The second half shows Pompey's control in possession, but the height of the bar suggests they were struggling to create clear-cut chances. Again, we should credit the diligent block Derby operated with throughout. With the possession numbers 70-30 in Pompey's favour, the shots on targets each were exactly the same. The approaches might have been totally contrasting, but with very similar outputs to show for it, you've got to praise both game plans and their brilliant execution. Of course, with no winner, no team was perfect throughout, but in moments and glimpses, it made for a fascinating contest between different ideas, different principles, flashing in all directions. Breaking down Derby's block was difficult for Pompey. Bishop's flick is delicious. We know Kamara is playing the football of his life right now. The box and goal is obviously wonderful. The two goals were moments of brilliance and they had to be. In the second half, Pompey had 73% possession, yet still had three less shots than their opposition, less shots inside the area, and less shots inside the opposition box. Diligent defending, fantastic off-the-ball organisation, but a classic case of Pompey finding a way again. Let's talk about the first goal, because I think it epitomises everything that's so great about this poor worn side. Sadie is dispossessed in the final third, Derby break up play, transition quickly, and Blackett Taylor drove with the ball and set up the goal. You can see the sheer difference in positions when Derby adjust quickly. Look at the space Joe Ward has, and Blackett Taylor on the ball, driving at you with pace is not a good thing whatsoever. Blackett Taylor has accumulated 67 chance creating carries this season, 29 have ended with a key pass and 38 have ended with a shot on goal. Derby have built the perfect dynamic blend. Robust players in the defensive third and players with raw pace in the final third. And that's what they're most dangerous at doing. Concede possession, turn over quickly and play with direct pace on the break. It was so evident during the game and when looking at the average positions, just how narrow Joe Ward was positioned. Derby wanted to overload in the middle, making it more compact and easier for the wide and quicker players to go 1v1 with the Pompey fullbacks. By playing inside, he found himself on the edge of the box, unfollowed and in space to hit two efforts on goal. And of course, we all know what happened next. One John Massinio's substitution changed Pompey's second half. I thought he made a mistake with his team selection, but adjusted well and made that switch. People will only speak about Owen Moxon because of his goal, but his impact yesterday was far more important than just that moment. Moxon, for me, should have started the match. The lack of mobility in transition between Pack and Evans made it so difficult for Pompey to track their runners on the break. In possession, it was a composed, tidy performance. On the turnover, it looked quite leggy and played into Derby's hands time and time again. 
they'll be perfect games for Evans. He wasn't bad yesterday, but the Derby game plan didn't suit his traits. When touching on key players from last night, Kamara once again impressed a brilliant goal, but Sean Raggett, he deserves a rare mention. He won nine out of his 10 aerial duels, made four clearances, and was involved in five defensive actions. In a game of war, Sean Raggett is the perfect way to combat the physical threats of Derby County. For Derby, a few stood out. Ibu Kamara was a box-to-box -box man. Mountain in the middle, Blackett Taylor was crucial going forward, but doubled up with Sibley defensively to help stop Kamara basically run the entire show. But Joe Ward was brilliant. His work tucking inside, his intelligence to break at the right times, and of course, his two brilliant goals as well. Joe Ward had to be man of the match, but there were quite a few names that weren't spoken about that definitely should have been. We're going around the grounds, Blackpool nil, Wickham nil, Bolton 5, Reading 2, Bristol Rovers nil, Shrewsbury nil, Burton 1, Barnsley 3, Cambridge 3, Wigan 1, Carlisle 1, Lincoln 3, Charlton nil, Stevenage nil, Cheltenham 1, Exeter 2, Leighton Orient 1, Peterborough 2, Northampton 2, Port Vale nil, Oxford United 4, Fleetwood nil, and of course on Tuesday night it finished Pompey 2, Derby County 2. Thank you so much for watching, until next time I've been Jack. Take care.